algorithms are important, but they should never take precedent over the human factor or, or the, the people, because ultimately those are the folks that you're targeting. It, it makes me laugh sometime where people talk about, oh yeah, I'm trying to game the algorithm. It's like, uh, maybe the, uh, there's a better way to say this, but you should be trying to game the people. <laughs> it's like people, algorithms, data, however you want to rank it, the people are always first. Meet Maximilian Naza, the engineer who turned a side hustle into a full-blown mini business empire. We're gonna dive into his data-driven approach, human-centric focus, and how he uses AI for good, not just for growth. He's the CEO of Passivite and founder of several startups, including Hope Records, the Y Combinator of music. Hey, this is Declan Dunn, the AI optimist, and I help entrepreneurs, small businesses, and creatives really use AI to their advantage and not get left behind. And in this episode, The Human Equation, AI Analytics plus Empathy equals Growth, we're going to discover how understanding your customers is the missing piece in your AI-driven strategy. From startups to learning later on, this wild story about what the WNBA and Snoop Dogg's attempt to sell a smokest grill have in common. It's a guide for any company or startup or person like Maximilian moving from a side hustle to full-time entrepreneur. Let's take a listen and hear what he has to say. As an engineer, you're obviously, um, from what I look back, very, very data-driven. And as we move into the world of AI and analytics, and quite honestly, we're just taking machine learning and calling it AI for most of the part that I see in analytics. <laughs> I, thank you, I, Chat GPT, right? So how do you ensure when you're taking these data-driven strategies, especially as we're working with various tools in AI, to stay human centric, you know, truly connecting with the emotional core of your audience rather than solely relying on the numbers. The philosophy on being data driven started with me initially. I tend to overthink stuff. So being data driven became a bit of an equalizer because mm -hmm. I'm whatever, but this is what the data is saying. Mm -hmm. But then early on, it, it used to, my approach was data or nothing. And then I would make decisions off of, you know, the data and then not get the necessary, the expected outcome. And there was a bit of a disconnect there. And I had to sort of figure out why. One, I learned that first you have to validate how your data is accurate. If you're making decision off of bad data, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. <laughs> it's yeah. just, it's not, it's, it's well, not. Welcome it's to not AI, gonna... by the way. Oh my God. <laughs> It's, it's not, it's not going to work out Two, you have to find a way to marry the data with reality. Data gives you insights. Reality gives you context. Nice. Uh, and by marrying the, both of them, you get the full picture, which is priceless. Mm -hmm. Say 2005, you want to put out a movie in the fall and then you're like, okay, Let's look at the genre of movie. So you want to look at the movies that have performed well in, in the fall. Uh, and then you want to look at, let's say, uh, from 2000 to 2005. And then you want to look at, uh, let's say, from 95 to 2000. Kind of like those two blocks, right? So you see that drama, everything else is great. You know, those are like perform well. But then meanwhile, nothing is going great, you know, from 2000 to 2005. But then it's like, uh, when you look at fall and then obviously you have 2001 and the, the attacks there, uh, again, if you don't take that into account, it's like, wait, oh yeah, I can't do drama. I, can't, I shouldn't release a movie, like no movies in September. <laughs> <laughs> but then when you take into account that something terrible happened. So that's the reality that when matched with the data mm -hmm. helps you kind of create a picture that makes sense. So it's like. Sure, the numbers went down, but because of this X factor, which is a, a once in a gazillion type of event, we can consider this segment, at least within the conversation, to be an anomaly. So it's like for this decision, let's give a little bit more weight to the data from 95 to 2000 uh, mm -hmm. and then use that to kind of decide this is the type of movie we're going to put out. 
And that's the, the human centric part is algorithms are important, but they should never take precedent over the human factor or are the, the people, because ultimately those are the folks that you're targeting. It, it makes me laugh sometime where people talk about, oh yeah, I'm trying to game the algorithm. It's like, uh, maybe the, uh, there's a better way to say this, but you should be trying to game the people. <laughs> it's like people, algorithms, data, however you want to rank it, the people are always first. And, and we try to, to, to maintain that, that, that focus uh, in, in our process and the decisions that, that we make. And you heard him say it. If you're making a decision off of bad data, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. Data is so key to understanding where we're going in business, and most people think it's like left up to math and spreadsheets. Well, as Maximilian shares on his LinkedIn profile, I'm all about creating products that not only work seamlessly, but also make life better. And as much as I cherish my engineering roots, my heart beats for driving innovation and growth as an entrepreneur. Forget mountains of data. Maximilian's about to reveal his secret weapon for startups spotting hidden patterns. Listen closely. This comes from experience with huge players like Kleiner Perkins and Google and startups just gaining traction. With analytics, we think of analytics traditionally as yes. a way to measure past performance. And as anyone knows, past performance is so not a guarantee of future results, right. but yes. it can be a tool, predictive analytics. Yes. How do you use sort of, and I'll call them AI driven analytics. I know there, there's right. much more to it. To, to sort of forecast those creative directions like you're talking about, to keep in context of what's changing with the discipline of what's happened, the patterns. Yes. So the, we deal with a lot of startups and those startups have limited resources. Right. So where we've found our niche or where we've been able to kind of get great success is identifying what's working and communicating that so that the company can just do more of it. So an example is, is social media. You're putting out a variety of content, video, long form, short form reels, you name it. And, and you're, you know, putting out the same content. Maybe there's a bit of variety here and there, but you're sharing across multiple platforms. And then you're realizing that what's working on one platform isn't necessarily working on the other. Right. Or you look at your analytics and, you know, Facebook is telling you you should do more videos, but then everywhere else it's like your videos are just not working. <laughs> and the data is, is pointing you in different direction. And, and to some folks, it can be a bit surprising, but the reality is that it actually makes sense because when you think about the prototypical user on Facebook, versus the prototypical user on Instagram versus the prototypical user on TikTok. I mean, they're people, but other than that, they have nothing in common <laughs> with, totally. with one another. So it's right. about identifying, okay, this is what you're doing. And when it comes to videos, sure, TikTok is a place for it or whatever, but you know, based on what you're doing right now and the team and the output that you're giving, you know, LinkedIn is the best place because on LinkedIn, your engagement rate is like, 30% or 15% higher than every other platform combined. So when it comes to video, focus on LinkedIn for now. You'll get more bang for your buck. So focus on this, focus on their energy in, in areas that are more likely to provide results. But there are very few in instances where everything a company is doing is wrong, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> at that I point- I have been there, but yeah. <laughs> Because typically that happens because of two things. It's either wrong messaging or wrong ICP. Right. So you have the right message, but you're talking to the wrong people. Or you have the right people, but your messaging isn't right. And that can be very tough to kind of figure out. <laughs> but once you have it, you know, not that everything gets easy, but it gets substantially easier from an A-B testing perspective. The assumption is that you know your business you know your customers. We know marketing, we know data. How can we join forces to help you move the needle in, in, in the right direction? Interesting, because, and I so agree, and being, you know, 
right message, right people, but also right time, because there's such a timing yes. aspect when you go into it. But when you're working with startups, which I love, I've been in startups for years, but one of the challenges when you're doing A-B testing, you know, you've also worked with big companies like, I mean, Klein Perkins, I, I don't want to name drop it. You've, you've got some great names to drop, Google. So you've been up to the point where they're, you know, they would want a million cute impressions to yes. begin testing. And you know, you can't get there with a startup. So how do you do that dance since you don't have the volume of data? How do you gradually use data to guide you? Um, not to call it intuition, but really a little of your experience, but also how do you guide those startups into understanding we're doing an A-B test, but <laughs> we really need like a lot more impressions to do in, you know, right. data-driven yes. A-B test. Focus, right? Focus. So if, if you want to... One one A is focus. One B is you don't have to A B test as much as you think, right. and I think that's that's one thing that I had to. I don't want to say learn the hard way, but when I came to that realization, it was like, duh, right? When you're first to market, you you have to pivot. You have to be adaptable, and I think. That, that's one of the things in interacting with founders sometime where it, it feels more like counseling than actual consulting right. because there's right. this like stigma of, I, I don't want to give up too early. How do I know have tried everything? And it's like, okay, but uh, there's some truth to that, but it's also a fallacy. Like you don't need to try everything to know what the right thing is for you. And it comes down to asking the, the right questions. And it comes down in saying that we're more alike than we think. Totally. We're more alike than we would like to believe. So, you know, my philosophy, our philosophy is A-B test to try to identify a pattern. And then once you identify a pattern or once a part pattern starts to define itself, Double down and just do a little bit more. You don't have to go head first into the pool. You can go look at the water, dip your toes, you know, put your foot in, sit down, you know, get like, get in, get out. Like there's a whole process. <laughs> and, and it's about really finding that level of comfort. But once you find something or once you identify something that has potential, go after it. Try to, you know, right. add in a little bit more depth and then seeing if, if, if there's something there. And, you know, if there is, great, you get to continue. If there isn't, a lot of time, those moments of quote unquote failure are, are the moments where you learn the most because it allows you to kind of come back with, with focus and knowing uh, what to make the next round of A-B testing about. Well, now it's time for what the WNBA and Snoop Dogg have in common, branding brainstorms, choosing the right success KPI. Not all measurements are created equal. Maximilian dissects the art of choosing the perfect KPI for your business, whether it's branding brilliance, WNBA victories, or a smokeless grill. The right KPI for the right situation begins in how you measure success and do it in a way that can help you thrive. Integrating data, AI into data analytics, does that change the way you measure success in these iterations? I mean, not that we have a specific measure at finding the thing to focus on, really, that we can start scaling. So knowing which KPI to measure is really important. So when it comes to, to sports marketing, and in our case, women's sports, we set up those those partnership we decided to to partner with them the aces and the sparks because we believed that they were on the up and up mm -hmm. which obviously with the arrival of caitlin clark and everything else so <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like okay right place right time right nice but yeah it just comes down to understanding the, the right kpis to measure for for each partnership each situation so everything we do, obviously the goal in mind is to get revenue, get leads, but then not everything will provide a lead right away. 
so in, in the case of, of sports, it's, it's a brand awareness play. Being out mm -hmm. in the community, doing different things. We get to interact with the other partners, which is an easy or easier sort of way in when it comes to warm introduction. I mean, you have, you know, Coca-Cola, Anthem, Los Angeles Department of Transportation. Hmm. I think Staying Level is the name is the name of like an entity. I mean, these are companies that are generating, you know, millions, if not hundreds of millions and, and billions of dollars in, in revenue. We're not at that level, but mm -hmm. we aim to be. And it's a situation where through this partnership, we get to potentially rub elbows with them. And the, the perfect scenario would be to have them, you know, become customers. Uh, but even if not, what we've been able to learn, how do you guys do this? How do you guys do that? Oh, we're doing things this way, you know, especially those entities that, that claim to be data driven as well. It's like, are you doing it any different? So is our approach scalable? And if it isn't, how do we know when to adjust it so that we can mm -hmm. kind of continue to, to cater to those folks to be, to be memorable. And that's and, branding. And those branding are, is being remembered. Right. Totally. Yes. And those are things that we can hold on to. And it's a kind of solid foundation to sort of go out and, and, and do great things. But then when you talk about like the Snoop Dogg collaboration with what's, what's this stove top or stove stool, I think they're called. It's like a smokeless grill. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know if you've heard about it, but yeah. I, I so, don't know the name of it, but yeah, yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so genius marketing campaign. Right. They did a collaboration with Snoop Dogg, which I'm assuming was probably in the seven figures. And the whole idea, I think Snoop Dogg came out on social media saying he was giving up smoking. Right. And anybody who knows Snoop, it's like, yo, there's no way. I'm giving up smoke. I know what you're thinking. Snoop, smoke is kind of your whole thing. But I'm done with it. Done with the coughing and my clothes smelling all sticky icky. And there was this build up for like, two weeks or a week and a half. And then eventually Snow was like, yeah, I'm giving up smoke, but then there's a grill and it's a smokeless grill. <laughs> so oh, yeah. it's, it's great. I mean, the whole world, <laughs> right. was like, wait, what you're giving up smoke, you of all people. That's crazy. But then there was a report that came out. The CEO ended up losing his job because they said that you know, the campaign didn't drive up enough sales. And now whether the two were correlated, I'm not sure. This is just kind of as an outsider, but on one end, you like, oh yeah, campaign didn't meet it, you know, drive the sales required. Uh, and the CEO loses his job, obviously, you know, coincidence, probably not, but like the campaign was a success. I mean, there's just no, <laughs> because most people wouldn't know who Stove Stool was. Now they do, right? The fact that I'm even talking about it right now and it has nothing to, they're not a client. We've never interacted with them. It's just a, like a tremendous case study of, of how things can go wrong when people are measuring the wrong thing. When you look at the, the details, I mean, I, I was looking at when I saw that announcement, I started reading more into the company. I think the ad came out within, I think it was like a month and a half left in the year, but then they make around 45% of their sales in the fourth quarter. Right. So you're coming up at the end of the year when people have most likely made all their financial commitments. You know, the ones that wanted to buy a grill probably did it already. <laughs> right. 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 So it's like the timing wise, I mean, had you come up in like October, you know, right at the end of Q3, then you could have kind of driven them up into, you know, that new season. You didn't announce a new tool, a new, you know, sort of like grill or whatever the case may be. And so, yeah, I mean, you kind of put all of that together and then you look at, okay, brand awareness. And even with the sales, it's like, oh, it drove up sales, but it didn't drive up enough sales, which obviously you kind of have to look at the numbers. You know, so right now, if somebody was to ask me, I didn't even know smokeless grill were a thing. So mm -hmm. if someone was to ask me, oh, yeah, like I want to get a grill, but I'm worried about smoke. I was like, oh, yeah, check out this stove tool thing. 
versus it before. It stops Snoop from smoking. <laughs> whereas before, I was like, I don't know. Why are you asking me? Because <laughs> at the we, end of the day, we want to help. But it's weird because it's it's the short term. This is what's like, I think AI has like really hurt marketers on the short term because you have this expectation from people who usually don't understand marketing, right? And they want the money in 30 days. I always joke, I say, oh, would you like fries with those sales? Like <laughs> right. One of our motto is we, we only win when you win. <laughs> Right. Because that's true. Right. Like I, I could we could have the greatest campaign in the world. We could build the greatest app. But if you're not happy with it or it doesn't drive the expected outcome, you know, we might as well have might as well have done nothing. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I, you know, you do have learning, you know, and it's and it's weird because it is hard. You know, it's funny when I used to uh, train my employees back when we had like, you know, sticks and rocks and try to get customers. I mean, we had nothing. You're just, and it was brutal. But I said, you know, reframe the failure. When it works, be amazed because this stuff rarely works. And it was so helpful to them because I said, the biggest problem you got is you're going to be on your own back. Okay. And it's also for you out there who are doing the side hustle like Maximilian and looking to become an entrepreneur. Detecting patterns in the data, listening to the past and rapidly changing market, do you keep up and adapt? All right, yes. this is this has been really, um, really, really awesome, Maximilian. I really enjoy you spending the time. How can people get in touch with you and um, and follow up and find out some of the things that you're doing? Where where can they reach out to you? Uh, uh, social media, I guess, is the place these days. You can follow. Uh... You can follow. <laughs> How did they get my number? <laughs> they bought it. You know that. <laughs> it's, it's a little too effective there. But yeah, so add Passivite on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. And this problem solver on Instagram. That's my personal page. And I tend to... I mean, I've been a bit more active recently, but yeah, sharing more about, you know, what I'm working on and behind the scenes. And I'd love to interact with folks as well. So, you know, feel free to send me questions and things like that. I'm happy to, to respond and help out in any way that I can.